Hi, welcome to Overlanding from Home. My name is Anton. I'm an avid overlander, lover of nature, and humanitarian by heart. The past while, I've always been interested in the outdoors, and I want to hear about other people's experiences and their rigs. Yes, the big rigs, the small rigs, everything they've done to design them and how they plan it. I hope you enjoy listening. Let's find out who today's guest is. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks again for signing in. And uh, today I've got, I, I don't know how to explain it, the volume of distance that this amazing family have done. Um, I'll introduce them in a second, and you can always go down and uh, follow their links uh, in the descriptions below. Um, but today I'm going to introduce uh, Molly and Mish, which is Dan, Marlene, and the kids. And just to be sure, the kids' names are, with it, okay, Ava 13, Mila 10, and Luca 8. So thanks very much, guys. I really appreciate this. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. It's going to be quite a gnarly chat. You, you've done an amazing job, Dan. And um, uh, I, I think as a, as a father to a family on the road, it's a bit of a challenge. And and to mom, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting one because you have so many different dynamics and factors to worry about. Food and distance and irritable kids and all sorts of stuff like that. I, I'm, I'm really interested to find out how it's going. So how are you? We're doing good. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Um, so I think, I think uh, Dan, let me, let me ask you a question. So um, in fact, it isn't really just for Dan, it's for you too, uh, Marlene. Um, when we first originally chatted, you said that you wanted to get on the road when you had your first kid and just go and experience a few things and, and what, uh, 12 years, something down the line? It's obviously a very different thought. Is that correct? Yeah, so it's been about 12 years. Like you said, we have three kids and our oldest turned 13 this uh, past January. So she's halfway to being 14 almost, which is kind of a scary thought from my perspective, but yes. things are still working out. Um, you know, 12 years ago, she was uh, not quite a year old. So more than 12 years ago now, she's not quite a year old when we decided to take her traveling. And obviously the other two kids being younger, they weren't born at the time. Yes. So, you know, our stories, like you said, it's a little different than most people. We didn't have this like crazy, you know, travel bug, wanderlust that a lot of people talk about. Yes. At least not back then. Uh, our goal was to being new parents, like wanting to show our new baby, like check out this cool place that we just brought you to like yes, this yes. world. You know, you got all this to look forward to like this huge, amazing place full of things. Like how do we even get started? <laughs> you know, so we did some little bit of traveling, like and I, quickly I realized like, you know, I was going to be the person carrying all the gear, the yes. pack and play, the stroller, the, you know, the car seat. And then anytime we went anywhere, duffel bag suitcases. And then we we're like, this isn't for us. We're not. And, you know, I, and I've been in the past really bad at like leaving stuff behind in hotel rooms and losing my phone, losing my keys, all this stuff. So I'm just like, you know what? This is a disaster waiting to happen. we got to travel differently. Yeah. So then we decided to get into kind of, you know, uh, like campers, you know, traveling by, by land, you know? So, you know, we got our first camper back in 2008 and you know, started out the first year, we had already been self-employed at the time, or at least working from home. So it, it wasn't difficult for us to say, you know what, if we're going to travel, we don't have to wait until we have time off. We can just go and work from the road. Correct. Not quite as easy back then as it is now, because, you know, we didn't have like 3G was the best thing. And when we found good, good 3G, we were thrilled. You know? <laughs> All around. <laughs> Yeah, we're like everybody. There's no, there's no nothing on YouTube yet, but watch whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. But yeah, so you know, long. It's been a long time. Like, like you said, it's it's changed quite a bit over the over the years. Obviously, the dynamic changes with more people in our family, yeah. and the type of traveling we do has been has been uh, evolving too. You know, we started out 
in the U.S., starting from California, just visiting a lot of cities, like, you know, like you would do, um, like if you were going to fly for a holiday, you know, you would go to like, oh, I want to go check out Austin, Texas, or Nashville, Tennessee, or or Seattle, Washington, like big cities. You yeah. know, you hear about big cities and like the sights to see and the foods to eat. So that's kind of how we traveled back then and stayed at campgrounds and stuff like that. And over time, we realized that, you know what, like this is kind of a perfect style of travel to go find more remote places, to be in nature and go visit all the national parks. You know, we, so we started evolving towards that. And then we, and now, nowadays, it's sort of primarily what we do. We try to try to involve more sort of nature type camping try to find stuff down a you know uh hard to find spot down a beaten yeah. path and uh we'll sprinkle in some culture and cities here and there i i think it's fantastic i mean obviously i have a i have a six-year-old daughter and i grew up in the mountains myself so it was a big deal for me to show my daughter you know like this is what it's like when your shoes are off and you're playing in mud you know which is what many city kids don't really get to do and my daughter completely loves it. I mean, if I said to her, we're going to get a van and travel or even in my Defender and say, listen, we're going to drive and see how it goes. You know, it should be, should be packed and ready in the car in about an hour. Um, and you need to, like you, being a dad, having to worry about all, all the other stuff. So I'm going to, I want to ask you quickly, right. I'm going to break this up into two. Dan, how did you choose your, your first camper? And Marlene, did you did you give certain criteria of have to but not important um, things for the camper? So our very very first camper, um, I don't know if you have these in South Africa. Um, they originated from Europe. It's called a tab. It's kind of a modern teardrop camper. Um, you know, they're. It's pretty popular now. I see a lot of them, but at back then, you know, we wanted something that that was small, and we wanted something that uh, we could pull with the vehicle that we already had. So we shopped around, and then we found a used one. And then, you know, we didn't have a huge like list of requirements because, like I said earlier, we were just kind of thinking about doing this as a way to, you know, take our kid out on some trips so we just, weren't planning on full timing at the time just like winging it yeah and that's kind of how it was with our uh when we decided from that tab trailer we went to a dealership that sold them and we saw airstream tra trailers and we fell in love with it right away um didn't think we were going to get one recession hit prices were really low and we snatched one up on, for a good price and that's the camper that we took to all 49 drivable states in the U S and beyond a little bit in Canada. Yeah. So I think, you know, even though we're in this four by four spinner van now, um, a lot of people who kind of follow our travels, um, have known us for being a family that lived in an Airstream. Cause we were in that for like seven years. Okay. And you know, it was, it was interesting because uh, the bigger our family grew, the smaller our camper got. <laughs> That's because of that evolution of wanting to go to places that are hard to get to. And, you you know, we needed to have a smaller vehicle and didn't want to tow a trailer. Yes. You know, so we uh, we we traded. Well, we, we didn't trade it. We still have the Airstream, actually. We have it set up on a on a friend's property in Arizona, and it's uh, being used in, as an Airbnb. I love it. So, yeah, so we still have it. And in fact, uh, we promised the kids because they're so attached to it. They grew up in that. They're so attached to it that we promised them at one point that we would never sell it. So, uh, you know, I got to be a person of my word. So I have to stick to that. <laughs> yeah, well, go to the stake and claim to to my, my defender, which is named uh, Ollie. And uh, she's like, Daddy, when you get a new Defender or a new vehicle, then Ollie's mine and we're going to drive together. And bear in mind, she's still only six. So, you know, there's great ideas. 
I'm I'm going to stick with them. I'm going to hold her to it. I'd love it if if it did happen. So, so out of the out of all the states, obviously getting getting the vehicle uh, or, or your or your camping stuff to uh, some of the islands is it is is it a challenge? I mean, have you been to the places like uh, and I'm talking about on your first leg, obviously out of the US, um, Hawaii and things like that. Is it is is it big enough to travel around or to get to, to get to them? Well, Hawaii is one the, the only state in the 50 U.S. states that we haven't haven't taken a vehicle to. Our kids haven't been, but we've been in the past. But we flew there. But you know that's that's something that we want to do, but we haven't really decided how to do it. You know, we've taken um, our vehicles to islands on ferries. Like obviously, we shipped our Sprinter. We're in Europe now, so we shipped our Sprinter from the east coast of the u.s across the atlantic yes to europe to belgium um you know we've taken we've taken our airstream to alaska but we drove that uh there is a way to get up there by the alaska marine highway through ferries we've taken our previous camper which was a on a ford f-250 four by four okay uh to newfoundland so newfoundland is also an island off the coast of uh Canada on the East Coast. We've taken it from the very bottom tip of Baja, California to mainland on a ferry also. That's right. We we sailed across from um, uh, La Paz mm-hmm. to Mazatlan. And um, we've also uh, taken our van on several ferries here in Europe. I think maybe the longest one is to the island of Crete. Okay. In, uh, Greece, right? Yeah. So in Europe, even though it's relatively short amount of time compared to how long we travel, but we've been here almost two years now. Um, and we've taken it to like 29 countries mm-hmm. in Europe. And we were practically at the southernmost point on the island of Crete okay. in Greece. We drove it all the way up to the the northernmost point in Norway up in North Cap. So, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've tried to, we've tried to take our van to as many places as we can and not just to, you know, we're not like your, like a lot of overland type, you know, they're very goal oriented. Like these, these will be like bucket list items, yes. but our motivation is more to see things, you know, yes. our own eyes, like to experience it and go spend some time there. So. You know, when we came to Europe, we knew that we wouldn't be able to do Europe in like six months. You know, <laughs> so that's why we committed to coming over here and just live, basically live here for as long as it took for us to feel like that we've seen it all. And that's kind of how we've, you know, done North America. Like we spent, you know, 10 years traveling all, all around North America and then we still feel like there's so many places that we haven't been to. I think it becomes very challenging, you know. If if many and I've and, and most of the people that I've had podcasts with, um, and I think you guys are like number twenty three at the moment. That um, there's a massive drive in order to be self sustainable on the road, and and you know if you're working from home, then it's easy to 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 just move from you know take a laptop from your desk to a laptop in your vehicle. Um, I did a podcast with a gentleman earlier last week, and he's a Dutch guy, lived in South Africa for about 12 or 15, about 15 years, um, and then just packed up. He said, I'm, I'm going to drive through Africa. And, and his exact comment was like, it was the same as yours. I'm going to go and see how it goes and keep going until I feel I need to stop. There was no end goal. There was no, I have to be here at a certain time. And, and I think most overlanders um, feel the need to, to put a cap on it. You know, they, they have six months to go from A to B or three months. I mean, I was chatting with, a, um, with another gentleman out of uh, Oman, and, and he was saying, how far will I get in Africa over three months? And I said, well, y- you could spend three months in one country. You could land, right. in, you know, put your vehicle in uh, Mombasa, and you could literally spend three months in Kenya alone, you know, and, and then you've got Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, you've got uh, um, Ethiopia, which all have incredible spots. And it's very challenging, you know, to, to, 
to sit back and go, okay, I think I'm I'm com- I'm completely done with uh, Finland, for example, you know, because there's there's always extra spots. It makes it very challenging, very challenging. Yeah, and you know, and 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 I understand that. I like like I understand how some people say, okay, I'm going to do this in three months or six months or twelve months even, and a lot of it comes down to like fin- finance reasons. You know, not everybody can work from the road, but I think this this pandemic that's creating a lot of awareness of what's possible. A lot of people are finding that it is possible to work from home. And if you're going to be working from home, then home can be wherever you want it to be. And I think that's why you are seeing a bit of a boom right now in, uh, in like camper van sales. Yeah. You know, a lot of people feel like that. Uh, I don't want to stay in hotels. I don't want to take buses or airplanes or ferries or boats or cruises. I want to be in my own space where I feel safe, but I still want to travel, you know? So now that they figured out that their job will allow them to work from home, at least for the foreseeable future until this whole thing is over, um, people are seeing that this is possible. Whereas before we talked to a lot of people, you know, their first thing is that, oh, I don't know how I could do my job you know, outside of the office or, or I don't know how to manage, like, how do you deal with having kids in the background and stuff like that? But a lot of the times, like now people are thrust into this, they have to do it. So they have, they're forced to figure it out. And I think some people are realizing maybe it doesn't work quite well, quite so well for them. And they're looking forward to going back to the office, but you know, those other people that are forced to figure it out, hopefully now have figured it out. And then now they actually can see this, you know, with a, you know, with a slightly different perspective that it is possible, you know, like we've been telling people for a long time. It's very true. You know, I did a, I did another podcast with a guy for um, out of, uh, uh, Hungary and he spent most of his time, um, along the, um, Eastern Europe, um, through into China, Mongolia, that type of thing. And, 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 and these are guys that I should actually introduce you to because there's a bunch of people in Serbia, um, uh, Turkey, uh, Hungary that have been through certain areas that may be able to give you tips. But anyway, he's, he, he's actually written uh, through his website um, two, two articles. One is how to be sustainable on the road and not have to be in the office. And the other one is um, how overlanding is the new holiday destination. Not that it's a place, but it's a, it's a way and things to do. I mean, personally, I would rather be doing what you're doing than sitting um, at a desk or going into a hotel. You lose so much of an area or a country um, uh, or a region by getting on a bus or, or, or flying in and out. So I think, you know, I, I actually hitchhiked America and Canada in 1999. And by hitchhiking it, I, I gathered so much in my head that it's still there. And I remember sitting in... Um, in Banff in Canada um, and in BC and, and, and watching these Chinese climb off a bus, take a photo, buy a little something, put it in their bag, climb on the bus and disappear. And, and I was bothered by that. It really, it really got to me. And to this day, how many years it is, it's still stuck in my head. I don't want to take a photo and then, and then get in my vehicle and disappear again. You know, it's, it's very different. And I think the way that you're doing it, and, and these are stories that your kids are going to remember. Oh, do you remember when we climbed off the ferry going into Morocco? And do you remember this? And, you know, this is the type of thing that kids don't forget. And we all know that all they do is inhale info. So it's, it's amazing how, how you planned it. And I think doing it from a young age with your, with your first kid, You've kind of just learned to just go with the flow. And I, I think this is something that, that I wanted to ask you, Marlene, is, is what is your basic requirement for the van? I mean, obviously, uh, Dan, you've, you've, you've put the van together with your wife. But, I mean, what is, what is the basic requirement? How do you guys do your sleeping and um, uh, cooking and cleaning and things like that? What is, what is it about the van that makes it so much easier? When we first started, there wasn't other families or online things to look at to figure out that there are different possibilities or options. So we bought the Airstream, you know, it had a queen size bed, it had a shower, it had a separate bathroom, kitchen. Um, and we just thought that's how 
all campers are. And once we yeah. traveled for a while and decided to downsize our home, the funny thing is my requirement was I don't want a permanent bathroom. I don't want an indoor shower. I just want a comfortable place for us to sleep and hang out and have safe uh, seating for the kids while we drive. And that's how it was with our four-wheel camper when we downsized. And then when we switched to our current Sprinter van, that was a similar thing. I wanted permanent beds for all of us. I don't want to have to break down, move comforters, pillows around every day. It's super annoying when you live on the road full-time with five people. So that was our number one requirement in the van. Permanent beds, factory seatings for for the five of us. Yes. Um, so we always have a place to sit and we always have a place to lay down. I love it. I love and it. I, <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, we have the luxury of knowing exactly what works for us because we've been we've been in since the beginning with that tab trailer. We have been in a tab, we were in an Airstream, and we were in a four-wheel camper, and then we later got a Casita trailer, which is a, a fiberglass trailer made made in Texas. Okay. And now we're in our fifth camper, which is the van. And aside from the van, everything else was factory built. They were laid out by some designer at these factories based on what they thought their customers wanted. So we were able to experience four different factory built campers and know what works and what doesn't work. So when we came to build our own van, we knew exactly what we wanted. Like we didn't, we weren't coming into this blank slate and then trying to figure out, will this work? Will this not work? It was very clear to us what does and what doesn't. And because everything's a compromise, you know, when you have, when you have unlimited space, of course we're going to want a permanent shower, permanent bathroom, like, you know, all the all the like comforts of a of a of a home but you always have to kind of compromise between how agile and nimble you are off the road versus how much amenities you have so we realize you know this is the easy this is actually really easy to figure out like how much time a day do you spend doing different things well most of our time is spent sleeping or at least the big, uh, the bulk, like the largest amount of time doing anything else is sleeping. So let's make sure we have all comfortable places to sleep. And the other times, you know, if we have to work, we're spent sitting somewhere, you know, so we got to have places to sit. We spend very little time going to the bathroom. We spend very little time taking a shower, you know, and then the next from that is like, we spend a slightly more time cooking and eating, but that's still not a majority. So let's just, Use that perspective. How much time do you spend doing something and prioritize comforts in those areas and then work down from there? And with five people in a long wheelbase sprinter, there's only so many combinations you have. And we're, yeah. you know, when we sort of lay this out, it's like, this is, this is the one, this has to be the one because anything else would, would be an experiment that may not work out and that wouldn't be worth it. I completely agree. And I think, you know, it, there's, there's, I, I say this a lot to new overlanders and campers is that there's always a way off and you need to figure out what the way off is going to be. Is it size and space? Is it weight? Um, you know, there's, there's so many different things. And, and I find it amazing that, you know, every, every six months I go through my own vehicle and I have a, I've done most of this stuff on my vehicle. Um, but every six months I go through it and I'm going, do I, you know, I've got this in here. Do I need it? If I don't need it, uh, will I need it one day? You know, is it something that's got to do with recovery? Um, if I don't need it, why do I have it? You know, let me, let me get rid of it or get something a little bit more sleek. And this is something that I've been, I think the last say three months and, and it, it just happened to be during the lockdown. And in fact, no, the last six months, um, I've been looking at other options for the same thing, you know, like a, like a little kettle, a uh, camp stove kettle and sleeping bags and uh, uh, little mattresses and things like that is, is, you know, do I need something bulky? Can I, can I downsize and um, sell it off and then buy something that's a little bit more streamlined or more of what I need? And, you know, I think that's, you guys have been through all of this in the first, say, three or four years understanding what you need. And I think you nailed it on the head. You know, you've, the only main time that you're in your vehicle is either when you're driving, which means you'll be sitting or when you're sleeping, the rest of it is really minimal. Obviously, unless it's raining, but it's really minimal. You don't want the kids to sit in the van. You want them to be outside having fun. I mean, and that's, 
That is, to me, the way that you've nailed it. I mean, looking at your van, I can't see all the proper pics of the inside, but from what I have seen, I think it's amazing. I think you've really, I think you've really got it down. Yeah. So the other thing that we we wanted to make sure that that worked for us too is that, you know, because we're not able to pick like windows of time to travel versus not since we're living in it, we have to make sure that if the weather is bad outside for extended periods of time, that we still can be comfortable all inside and not be driven nuts. So that's why that's why the van ended up working better for us versus our last vehicle, even though. The dimensions are pretty similar. It's about the same length. It's about the same width. And, when, you know, the last one had a pop top. So with the top up, it's about the same height. But the big difference for us with the van is that we're able to incorporate the cab space that we're, we're sitting in when we drive into living space as well, where we're, whereas we couldn't do that with the, with the truck. So now we have, like, compartmentalized spaces, even though know, it's still just the inside of a van. So we have... We can actually have five people all laying down on the bed like we would when we're sleeping and still have five people sitting down. I mean, not that we ever have 10 people in our van, but, you know, we have these different sections of the of the area that that works well for us. So, yeah, we want them to be outside as much as possible. Like this place that we're at right now, it's amazing. It's beautiful. You know, we're 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 actually sitting on the shady side of the van outside right now doing this podcast, you know, and it's weather's perfect and i'd rather be here doing this than inside the van you know but on the other hand if it starts to rain it's okay too you know if it's really bad weather yeah we have the luxury of packing up and driving some other place that's nicer so that's that's the thing you know we don't have to be stuck somewhere if it gets really bad i think it's very very cool and i I, I'm, i'm just having a look at some of your gear here so you know um we all know victron they're really really good um electric components um you've got a good size uh, gas cylinder which will obviously last you well do you use do you do you swap between so we call it a braai which is a barbecue for you do you barbecue uh, or braai as often as you can or do you prefer to just use the gas and uh, and get cooking out the way for dinner um the you know we carry we carried a barbecue for the last 2 years and um you know we intended on using it more but we didn't end up using it as much as we thought mostly because um it requires a lot of water for cleaning you know and water becomes a pretty scarce commodity when you're in the middle of nowhere and you have five people so you know we think about okay i would love to have this piece of meat grilled instead of cooked on the stove but what sacrifices are we making because of that? So like you were saying earlier, like every six months, you figure out what works and what doesn't, what you can optimize, what you can't, you know, we kind of did the same thing with the barbecue. It's okay. If we got rid of this barbecue, what do we lose? And in its place, what can we put there instead? You know? So in fact, we just sort of decided that the barbecue, let's try it without for the next few months and see if we really miss it. So we don't barbecue outside as much anymore, but we do have the ability to like cook over fire. We have skewers, we have a uh, cast iron griddle that, you know, we can place over an open fire. So, you know, we don't have fires that often. And actually here where we are right now, somebody built the fire pit, but we took it apart because we we're in the middle of the forest and we don't want to, in the summertime, it's not legal to have a fire. Yes. So we're not cooking outside that much, but, it is like that where we're optimizing things ongoing and it's not that different than like what like a backpacker would do to op- optimize their gear. Cause they're also very weight sensitive. Yes. You know, you want to, you spend 50 bucks on a titanium cup over a stainless cup because it weighs like three ounces less, you know, or something like that. But to us it's not obviously not that extreme, but, you know, we have to kind of balance because we do live full time in it. We have to balance not just lightweight and compact also has to be durable. Like we don't want to have something break and have to be replaced every six months to a year. We rather carry something that's a little bit heavier duty. That's going to last us. True. Very, very true. So, so I, I actually have a little guest bride that I'll, I'll send you a link to it. I completely love this thing and I bought it because um 
when I first started going out uh, uh, a lot further distances and a lot more hectic terrain, I didn't want to get I didn't want to get somewhere and it's like you know half past six at night and back there my daughter would have been two or three and she's crying because she's hungry and my my wife's trying to you know uh, shoot me with her eyes because we're late and um, I bought this little this little gas bry um, from Amazon on the US and I completely love this thing. Um, I, I, I've I reconnected it so that it fits with a, a similar cylinder that what you have. I just got a pop with a, a quick release um, attachment and I use it. I use the same cylinder uh, for everything to do uh, teas and coffees. I use a pan um, as well as for the gas bry. And I, I think I'll send you a link if it works for you, fine. But it, I tell you what, it just makes life so much easier. And then the reason I actually ask it is because obviously – Brying or, or using a barbecue is a little bit is, is a lot more time consuming and a lot more relaxing than it is just getting dinner out, out, out the way. Maybe I'm maybe I'm actually saying it a bit too insensitive because you guys do it all the time. <laughs> 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 okay, let's just move on. All right. So um looking at some some of your other gear, I see you've chosen BFG KO2s. They're a, they're a good type. Yeah, we we actually have been using BFG since uh, we downsized from the Airstream. When we switched to the the 4x4 four-wheel camper, what we realized is that this is the best tire that's both for on-road and off-road. You know, we've tried uh, some Michelins. We've tried try some Coopers. I mean, those are all good tires also. We haven't tried any general tires, and I hear that those are also good. Yes. But we just had really good experience. And I, you know, with, with the BFG Alterings, like, it, I go way back to, like, high school when I first started driving. I had a, I had a Jeep Wrangler YJ, and I had BFG Alterings on that. Of course, they're the older versions from the early 90s. Yeah. But I just loved them. And then I looked at them again, and then we switched them to uh bfgs on our ford f250 and i actually found those to be quieter on the road than the stock like street tires that they came in you know so when we uh when we got the the sprinter we actually tried coopers for a while and then we switched back to the bfgs which which coopers did you try dan uh do you remember the name they were don't Okay. <laughs> I can dig it up and send it to you. It's not a they big were, deal. I, I think they were comparable to to the KO2s. Mm-hmm. Like maybe they were the one they were the Cooper version of the KO2. So but you I'm, know, like for us it's really all, also about just you know the durability. Like we've had really good experience off road driving on rocks, you know. Yes. And um and they last, you know, we get Man, I don't know, like fifty, sixty thousand miles on these tires. That's good. On that's road. Really good. Yeah. That's really, really good. That's uh that's impressive. I mean, uh all terrain tire. It's 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 a really, really good tire. They they Cooper in in the southern half of Africa is becoming a lot more popular because um it works the compound is really uh is designed for the terrain. Um, but KO2s and BFG have a very good name in the in the industry, and I, and I, I mean I'm not knocking them at all. They're just very different to what we would like, what I would use for where I go. But there's a there's a number of things that everyone does according to what they want, and they, and there's no right or wrong. Listen, they're they're a good tire. Um, I want to ask you. So, did you choose the Dometic fridge, or did it uh, was it a was it part of the deal with the van? You know, we've we've actually had Dometic products going all the way back to the beginning because our Airstream came with all Dometic products. Okay. Fantastic fans, Dometic air conditioning, Dometic fridge, Dometic stovetop. You know, so we actually have been using it. And before we even started working with them, you know, we, we started working with Dometic um, about three years ago, I think. Okay. They reached out to us. And say, hey, you know, we're we're starting this ambassador program, you know, and we're like, oh, we use your products for the last eight years already or nine years already. So, you know, yeah, 
you know, we, we, we love it. And it's a perfect kind of marriage between an ambassador and a company. And we've been, we've been, um, you know, like offered programs like this from companies that we don't know. And, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to, to work with them when we don't know anything about their product. So that's why we, you know, we, we agreed to work with the medic on something like this. And the Dometic fridge was actually something that they gave us to try before we built the van, before we even bought the van. They say, hey, you know, we uh, we acquired Waco from Australia a few years ago, and now we're rebranding them to Dometic. Yes. And we knew that Waco had a good reputation. They had good fridges. So then they're like, we'd like to send you one to try out. So they sent us one, but we didn't really have a way to use it back then because, you know, until the van, everything was factory built and came with a fridge. So we already had a Dometic upright fridge in there. So we're like, yeah, great. So it was, it was funny because when we first got that fridge, I was looking at it. And I was looking at Marlene's like, you know, we should build a van around this fridge. <laughs> 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 Rather than buying a van and then, you know, figuring out what goes inside. Like that fridge was like, okay, you know, now, <laughs> now we got to do something with this. <laughs> I have to put it somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he was totally joking. And I then, was totally joking, but it ended up happening a couple years later. Yeah, one day I'm like, yeah, let's let's get a van. <laughs> shall we shall we shall we leave a kid somewhere and take the seat and put <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Imagine all the all the drinks, all the extra drinks we can stuff in here. <laughs> oh, lovely. But I I mean, so so it's a 65 liter, right? Yeah, we started with the 65. We started with the CFX 65. Um, but we've actually upgraded just last year when they came out with their CFX three series, we upgraded the 75. Okay. Main reason is because the 75, um, has two compartments so we can have a freezer, a dedicated freezer. And And it required a little bit of, you know, reconfiguring of our fridge platform. We had to extend it by 20, 30 centimeters. Mm -hmm. And that actually worked out. We had the space to do it. And we ended up building a shelf that we can put our, like, spices and oils on for cooking outside. Rather than in the past, we had to dig them out of a, a, a cabinet before every time we cooked. So now it's actually, you know, the fridge is bigger and we have more storage space for pantry stuff. It's, it sounds like it's really, uh, you guys have really found a way to make things happen for what you need. And I think, you know, I have a, I have a 40 liter and I'm on borderline now trying to figure, should I get something slightly bigger? But, you know, I can't, I have the only one back area of a defender. I can't exactly just, uh, move it up because if I do, it's going to take up a little, a little bit too much extra space. And then I'm going to, uh, not be able to put my, um, ammo crates next to it which i've i've designed to to tie down so i'm in a bit of a predicament myself yeah. um, you know it's it's i'm i'm quite surprised that even a 75 liter works for 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 five of you because you know kids at that age are just inhaling food and uh i i you, do you do you have a lot of dry storage you know um peanuts raisins you know dry snacks that you that you yeah that kids snack on I, during the day i would say um even with the 75, you're right. Like it's after we go shopping, we, uh, we have food everywhere, <laughs> you know, like after we, like, if we know we're going to be a few days, we go, we go, you know, stock up before. And it's always like, we get to where we're going. It's okay. We got to eat some of the stuff off of our bed <laughs> so we can free up some space. But yeah, they do eat a lot these days. Every day seems like they're eating more, you know, for a few years we were able to get away with like them sharing like one adult size meal, but those are those days are long gone. Now they're practically eating an adult size meal per per person. Yo, the logistics are very very in, 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 interesting. So, I mean, out of out of seven nights a week, how many how many how many lunches and dinners do you eat? Uh, at a takeaway or a restaurant or something compared to uh, making it in van? Well, lately, since uh, since we crossed into Morocco back in uh, February. February, so for the last six months now, we we probably have eaten out less times uh, than I can count on one hand. Sure. Just because... You know, during the pandemic, 
we were concerned about like, okay, is it safe? Is it safe to eat out? Should we just make food? So we ended up just making food. Even in Morocco, what's really cheap to eat out, you know, we end up camping at places where there's no practical place to go eat out. So we just stock up on groceries and then we, we make like, you know, if you, if you do the numbers for the last six months, that's probably like 99% of our meals in. That's, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, it, it, it takes a, a lot of effort to, to try and make it work. Yeah. Hasn't always been the case though. You know, it hasn't always been the case. Like I was saying at the beginning that our modes of traveling have changed. And at the beginning, when we're going to Nashville, like, Hey, we're in Nashville. We've got to eat in Nashville. <laughs> we're in Austin. We've got to eat in Austin. We've got to go to, you know, we've got to go to, uh, you know, the 72 ounce steak place in Amarillo, Texas. And <laughs> we've got to go to this, you know, the famous fish market in, uh, in Seattle, Washington and eat. Yes. eat there so we did a lot of eating out and actually I, I would even say even towards the end of us traveling in uh, the united states like it was it's much easier for us there to eat out because it's easy to park um you know seems like food places are everywhere and sometimes like you say you drive 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 and you can either spend an hour on the side of the road make food do dishes clean up or you can spend 20 minutes, hop into a place real quick, grab a bite, and then be on the road again. So, you know, when we travel, like, faster and longer distances, I think we tend to eat out more because it's more convenient. Yes. But in the last six months, because of all the stuff that's happening, we've slowed down a ton, which means that it's it's not a big deal to spend, you know, some time cooking, figure out what we want to eat, and just take things slowly. So I want to I want to just touch on it quickly, and, and uh, the podcast isn't about the virus, but um, I, I've I've read a bunch of times. Quarantined? Uh, how many times have you been quarantined? We uh, officially have already been only been quarantined once, which okay. is well, when we went down to Morocco in February. We spent almost two months, or just about two months, there before the lockdown happened. And then, um, you know, on our YouTube channel, you can see like the whole story about us being locked down. There's probably four or five videos where we sort of showed the, you know, what happened to us while we were there and how we, you know, eventually got on the ferry with a bunch of other people. But we were in a yeah. kind of a staging area and we weren't allowed to leave. So I guess that's kind of quarantine in a way, but that's more of a lockdown than anything yes. else. But when we came back from Morocco to Europe, um, it took us, we went from Morocco to France uh, because Spain was peaking at the time and they weren't allowing anybody in. So we had to take the long ferry to France. And from France, we took three days to drive back to Croatia, where is actually our, our country of residency at the moment. So we were allowed okay. to come back. And when we came back, we had to officially be quarantined for 14 days, not allowed to leave the apartment that we were in. Yeah, couldn't take out our trash, get groceries. Yeah, and since, since then, we've stayed in Croatia. We haven't left Croatia since we got back. And this would have been uh, about four months ago. Sure. Okay. But you, you're obviously enjoying Croatia enough that, you, that you're not in a, in a rush to, uh, to find another spot. No, so Croatia is actually Marlene's parents' home country. That's where they were born. So that's how we were able to get residency here. Marlene and the kids have dual citizenship. They have American passports and Croatian passports. And me, as the spouse, I was able to get uh, residency. So that actually worked out really well for us because it gives us freedom to travel Europe pre-pandemic. And then yes. post-pandemic, it gave us the the assurance that we'd be able to come back to Europe. In fact, some of our friends that were Americans and Canadians that were in Morocco at the same time as us, they were stuck there for months after we left because they weren't allowed into Europe. So, cool. you know, we, we, uh, we've been to Croatia a number of times before, a couple times with kids, a couple times before we had kids. Marlene's been coming here since she was a kid. Um, but Croatia's, uh, like most of Europe, summer is the popular place where everybody 
you know, takes holiday and vacation and go travel. So it's really yeah. busy in the summer, like especially right now. Right now is basically the peak. And our original plan was to not be in Croatia during the summer, to avoid the crowd and also to avoid the heat. We wanted to be in the northern parts. That's why last summer we went to Norway. This summer, the original plan was to be in Scotland, you know, and then we wanted to go sort of travel based on seasons and, you know, to get nice weather. But knowing that this was going to happen and we came back to Croatia in April, suddenly we realized this was an opportunity to spend a summer in Croatia that we weren't planning on doing and actually do some swimming in the Adriatic Sea that had we not been here in the summertime, it would be too cold to swim in. Correct. And Correct. we also felt like, well, this is also a good opportunity to be in Croatia during a season that's probably going to be the least amount of people that they've seen for a probably a couple decades because it's gotten so popular as a destination that in the summer, you know, you just that shoulder to shoulder, you just you don't even want to be here. But we felt like, wow, this is an opportunity to kind of be at a a destination place that's not as crowded as a normal year. But it turns out it's still pretty crowded, so we had to get away from the coast. <laughs> We're hiding in the mountains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a slight backfire. <laughs> yeah. Slight backfire. But, you know, it got us to explore. It's kind of like where we're from in California. You know, we uh, we used to live just a couple hours from Joshua Tree National Park. And it took us probably five, six years of traveling on the road before we ever went to Joshua Tree for the first time. Because we always took it for granted. We always assumed that's going to be there. You know, we'll go. But yeah. we went to like all these different places on the East coast, went to the Florida keys, went to all these different national parks around the country before we even went to the national park. That's closest to where we used to live. So I feel like Croatia was kind of that way too. It's like, Oh yeah, we'll go to, Cro we'll go to these national parks in Croatia when we have the time. But you know, this happens to be the perfect year for us to do that. So we're enjoying having the opportunity to do it here, even though, you know, it wasn't the original plan, but the time, the, the way that we travel, like you say, you know, we have that flexibility and we're making the best of it. And and that's the way that it should be. I mean, I, I think we, we, we've touched on it already that it, it's, it's, it's very difficult and you lose so much of uh, so much feeling of where you're going if you rush it. So I want to ask uh, just one or two more things. And then I'm, I'm sure you, you've also got a day to get to us. What do you use for your navigation? I mean, do you use the the general Garmin stuff and then buy the maps for the areas that you're in, um, or do you just buy road maps uh, in the country that you arrive? Do a brief planning online and then and then start heading out. We don't. So we don't do a ton of planning as far as where we go. So um, we have general ideas of where we want to go. So I. I've always just, I don't have any specialized overlanding, like navigational gear. And I think it's mostly also because the way that we got into this lifestyle was gradual. It was not like, you know, we, we didn't plan a big trip where I had a lot of time to spend in front of Google and Amazon research the best stuff. Whatever I had at the time, 12 years ago, that's what I stuck in the dash of my window. And then we started driving with it. It was just the yeah. basic Garmin. And I've gotten two or three other basic Garmin um, GPSs since. You know, we went to <laughs> we're 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 so we're so um, we're we're so bad. Maybe bad is not the right word, but we're so you know this whole this whole not planning where we're going thing is so embedded in us that we when we went to Alaska, we drove in across into Canada. It wasn't even the first time we went to Canada. We drove into Canada and we realized our Garmin didn't have Canadian maps. <laughs> and then we went to, a, went to a Canadian Walmart and bought a, a, a basic GPS there so we could have Canadian maps. So we can drive through Canada and then obviously in Alaska we had maps. But nowadays, um, you know, be, because we have to work also, yeah. so we have to have internet connection. It's not difficult to just even use Google Maps as our navigation tool and just 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 use our phones and have our Garmin as the backup. And also, you know, if we have to download offline maps, if we don't have internet service for whatever reason, uh, we use maps.me, 
you can download offline maps for that. That's right. And in Morocco, um, some countries, surprisingly, I don't know, maybe other parts of Africa too, but in Morocco, we didn't have uh, turn-by-turn navigation in Google Maps. Really? It just the feature wasn't available, so we we use they use um, they use ways there. So we yes. just turn on ways and use ways there, you know. But a lot of the more interesting adventures that we went on have been rooted in the misnavigation of our of our GPS. Lovely, lovely. Uh, I, I uh, I've I've just moved over from the Garmin. They they stole it out of my vehicle uh, uh, during the first three weeks of lockdown, and um, oh, I've just got an iPad Mini and connected a um, the Garmin InReach Mini, and that makes it everything for me. It's my media in my vehicle. It, I can download uh, movies onto it. Um, it's my um, my mapping and routing, I've got everything on it. So maps.me, map out. Um, I end up using Google Maps a fair amount because it's nice to map for me when I do my uh, humanitarian work. I, I map out where I'm going on uh, on my iMac, and then I just transfer it straight onto the computer, I mean, onto my uh, onto my uh, iPad mini, which makes life a little bit easier. So I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, like you are, multiple functions off the same, off the same item. So... I, uh, yeah. I it did work out for me, but I think I think you know what you just said is very true to how you're living your life, and uh, and and it's it's exactly that you're literally climbing in and you and you're heading out. Which way will go that way, and 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 stop when we need to stop. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, and you know the other thing about um, how we use Google Maps too is that I put a lot of pins on. Yes locations that people tell me about and then you know if we happen to go into a place and i'll just look at what pins i've put you know i remember going to bulgaria last year for the first time and then suddenly i realized i was near this cave that i had placed a pin almost a decade ago i saw some photo on on social media of this really cool cave that had these two holes that form a set of eyes beaming down from the roof now wow it's like we should go here one day. And this is way before we ever thought that we would ship our vehicle to Europe. And then suddenly I was within like half a day's drive from it, you know? So just constantly like looking at, you know, what people, where people are going to just looking at things that interest us and then placing pins. And then now, you know, when we first came to Europe, that cave in Bulgaria was the only pin I had on the continent. And now when you know, open up Google maps, there's like, you know, hundreds of pins Endless. all over. Endless. So, yeah. All right. So, so just two more things, quick. Um, Marlene, what's your 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 most or best used item you have in the van? That's not like permanent. Um, Do you want it to be like a common? Should it be an unexpected one? <laughs> it can be anything, anything that you think I could not live without this in the van. Hmm. Every single item is, is, has got basically sure. become something that we can't live without because we, if we live without it, it's gone. <laughs> but I'm going to let Marlene say her top one then. This is going to maybe sound funny. But there, we have this collapsible bucket that I really love. And it's just, <laughs> I don't know when the material, <laughs> it, it, you know, collapses. And it, I use it if I need to wash dishes outside or if I'm at a campground, I need to take it to a sink far away. I can do laundry in it. I can store extra groceries from the grocery store and our wine bottles in it. Um, it's just, I really love it. Well, has, so we actually... <laughs> We actually said this to our friends a couple of years ago who also travel. Um, yes. You know, they've they've gone to a bunch of different countries with their van as well. We told them this is the best thing we have in our van. And they're like, you know, thinking we're just pulling their legs. Like, the best thing, really? The best thing? <laughs> Out of everything? Like, well, actually, yeah, I think it is the best thing. And then you know what? They got one. Next year, <laughs> they got one. <laughs> Yeah. That's beautiful. And um, and uh, Dan, what's yours? Well, um, I love that bucket too, to tell you the <laughs> truth. But um, the best thing um, 
I love that I routed uh, a plug from the house battery up to the dash above my head. Uh, to the little, there's a little storage shelf above the driver's seat. I routed a 12 volt socket from the leisure battery to the front so that I can just leave things plugged in there and I power everything from it. I power wow. GoPros. I power the GPS. I don't have to worry about it draining the car battery because yes. it's running off of the back. So That's it's, you know, yeah. So it, it be, before I would wake up in the middle of the night and thinking, Oh my God, I forgot to unplug that thing. That's using the house bat or the, the car battery. We're going to wake up with no way to start the car. So a, a lot of my, my favorite things in the, uh, in the vehicle has to do with how much trouble would I be in if I didn't have it? Yes. Lovely. That's good. Uh, listen, I've, I've put, I've put uh, USB charging points in certain areas. And I think one of the, one of the best things I've done is taken a cable that goes through my dash at the back without having to drill a hole and charges my iPhone and my iPad while driving. And it's a completely like hidden, hidden cable. So I, yeah, I, exactly. I'm 100% respect what you're saying. Cause if it, <laughs> if it wasn't there, it would be more clutter in my face while I'm driving. Right. Nobody notices it because it's all hidden away. They're just like a little wire poking out, but it, it changes everything. Completely agree. So, so this is um, my last question here is something that that you know people tend to know off off the top of their head. So you know maybe you guys do. So, what is your best and worst moment while being overlanding? I, I, and and it's a tough one because you've had you, you know you have a, a long history of twelve years. So I mean, do you have anything that sticks to that sticks out in your head right now that is? your best and worst moment. And they both don't have to be the same. You know, Marlene, you can have a different one to Dan. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, there was this moment when we we're in Oaxaca, Mexico, where like we had a deal with like a shady taxi driver who were friends with the police and they're trying to scam us for a bunch of money. And it was in front of the kids and the kids were really scared. So like, it wasn't necessarily, I wouldn't call it like my worst moment. It was just a very, very unfortunate moment because yes. we love the country so much that to have something like that kind of taint our memory to have something like that happen Give in front a of the kids taste in your mouth at a young age too and i feel like that they were like truly frightened because they were you know oaxaca is a uh, one of the poorer states in mexico so you know there's a fair amount of just small time corruption you know, with the police there. So they yes. were really just there to like get some money out of you, but they do it by way of intimidation. So there were like six or seven police cars and a dozen police there for something that like this taxi guy claimed that we like cut him off, even though, you know, it, but yes. to have that happen, to have that sour taste in, in our mouth for the place was unfortunate. But by and large, like we still love Mexico and it's one of the places that, you know, we potentially would want to have a piece of land there and maybe mm. have a little little getaway somewhere on the coast. But that that was not a great moment. Um, and the, I agree. I agree. That's my yeah. probably worst moment, too. And then some of our best moments. I don't know. I remember I didn't actually. So my best moment is is something that happened to Marlene. I think. Oh, awesome. maybe she'll agree too. <laughs> we were in. Uh, <laughs> we're in. We're in Alaska, and we had been in Alaska. It was during the summertime, so it was. Uh, you know, the sun is out like it is in in uh, the in Scandinavia here, and in, in the northern latitudes where the sun doesn't go down. So it never gets really dark enough if you go to Alaska in the summer to see northern lights. But we want to see northern lights really badly while we're up there. So we stay. It was probably like late August. And it's starting to get a little bit chilly. And it finally gets dark enough right around right around like 1 o'clock, you know, for us to see northern lights. And then we like, we waited this one night. We knew it was going to be clear. We knew that we had a good opportunity that the, the, were favorable, that it was going to happen. Okay. 
And then I remember seeing it. They start coming down and dancing. And then I drove around. I took the truck and drove around to the, the other side of this bay that we were at to get a better view from the other side. But then I was talking to Marlene on the phone, and then she was telling me that I'm looking at these. Are you seeing these lights? It's amazing. I didn't think that they would move like this. And she said, you know what? And I looked down on the ground. There was a bunny <laughs> standing next to me, also looking up at the northern lights. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> like mesmerized by yeah. these lights. <laughs> because we were in the city. We're in the city. Uh, uh, Val- Valdez. Valdez, yeah. Somebody in Valdez had decided to get bunnies for their kids. And then a couple years, or even maybe even less than that, decided that they don't want these bunnies anymore. So they just let their bunnies loose. And now they're just like <laughs> like wild bunnies running around the whole town. Because you know, you know what they say about bunnies. They, oh, yeah, of course. They, they multiply. Yes. But it's somehow kept in a reasonable population because, you know, there's some... The cold and predators. Yeah, there's some predators around. But yeah, there there are just these random bunnies hopping around. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 geez, you know, I, I I say this every every podcast, but no good story ever starts it off with when you when you went to the kitchen to boil the to boil the kettle for a cup of tea, you know, and right, it, right. it it, it no happens every there. single time. Yeah. So so listen. Yeah, I don't know. A, do, you, do you have a different different no, one, or is that I, yours too? I think you covered it all. <laughs> oh, you, you took the easy way out, Marlene. But no problem. Listen, I, I don't think there's 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 much that'll top bunnies staring at the lights with you. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so, you almost I almost expected the bunny to have like a camera to take photos of it. <laughs> Beautiful. I love it. So you guys have done I think it was 250,000 Ks in the US, right? Yeah, so basically, you know, we were living full time on the road, so uh we never actually did any kind of like calculation of how many miles we drove, but okay. Whatever miles we have on the vehicles, that's how many miles we drove. Sure. You know, because we were full time. Yeah, we went through three vehicles over that time. And it was about 250,000 miles. It's a big big number. So, uh, you know, now that you've got residency uh, in in Europe and obviously back in the U.S., any plans on coming to uh, into the southern part of Africa? We will see how we feel about this more modern because our concern is uh you know taking a more modern sprinter van with the modern diesel engine in certain countries that we may not find the proper fuel for it okay. so it's the same concern that we have for central and south america that we need ultra low sulfur diesel and a lot of places you can't get it and it's uh you know these new these newer vehicles they're not great with um the high sulfur or the higher sulfur diesel and you know they'll just go into cripple mode and Mm. we don't want to be stuck somewhere because you know we put the wrong fuel in there so until we do some more research and figuring it out like we would we would love to either come down further into africa or you know if we have the ability to drive across uh asia whether it be through you know, Mongolia or Russia or maybe the, the stands. Yes. Uh, and then maybe somehow end up in, in, uh, on the Pacific side of Russia. Yes. Yes. And go back to California that way. So, you know, that's, those are all options, but you know, we we'll probably won't know until another year or so from now, which way we're going to go. Sure, sure. Well, you know, we uh, most so we have fifty p and and five hundred p. Five five hundred is mostly for the uh, for the big trucks, and um, in most cases, yeah. you can get good quality diesel in static. Uh, in fact, in in all over, I've I've never most most guys put an extra um, uh, filter through, you know, just to catch uh, any any other junk or nonsense or or, or moisture. But right. either way, either way. You've got a fan. Yeah, I mean, for there's. You. I think there's a there are mods that we can do to make the van accept, you know, more various types of diesel. Yes. Um, you know, we just have to figure out 
if that's something we want to do while we're here so we can go further or if that's something we want to do when we get back to North America, maybe do the mod and then go south from there. Yes. But until we find the right process and the right, you know, because we also bought this van new a couple years ago and we, whatever mods we do to it will void the warranty. So we're sort of thinking about waiting for the warranty to expire first. And then, you know, there's no reason for us to not do it. Correct. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, listen, you have a big fan waiting for you when you get to uh, South Africa. Um, hopefully, hopefully sooner than later. And, 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 and guys, thanks really much. I really love this. I think I could have spent another hour talking, but we, we, we have a day to, to, to start. So thank you very much. Um, and blessings to all five of you. I, I'm really um, amazed at how you've, how you control it. I mean, there was stuff I didn't even get to ask you, uh, schooling and things like that, but maybe another time. But listen, enjoy the summer. Thank you very much for the effort and the time that you've given into chatting. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm very excited to see where you guys are, are heading off to next. At the moment, things are lightening up in Europe. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having us. We enjoyed it as well. Thank you. No problem. Have a good rest of your day, Dan and uh, Marlene, and, uh, and 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 go and have some good meals. I think you deserve a, a bit of a snack out instead of in of the in the van. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll make the kids cook lunch for us. <laughs> well, maybe you want to eat instead of uh, you know cleaning yeah, up. Clean more. up. <laughs> There'll be a lot of cleanup to do. <laughs> Enjoy your right, day. Tom, Thanks thank you. very much thank for you. your time. Okay. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.